How's the weather looking out there in Novi, Michigan? It is um, cloudy. It is in the mid 60s. And um, we, the, the drought, the weekly drought maps just came up, came out this morning and we are officially in drought. And we're gonna get an inch of rain tonight. So that'll really help. Soil is very, very dry here. We've yeah. had three one hundredths of an inch of rain this month. It's pretty dry out here too. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't bode well for the summer. No, it does not. Well, I've got 6.30, so shall we get started? Awesome. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Cindy Harn, and I'm the Executive Director for the Nature Foundation of Will County. We've got quite a few people joining us um, from the Chicagoland area and the Will County area. Many of them are our foundation supporters, but we also have people from the West Coast and the East Coast. So welcome. Um, the Nature Foundation of Will County, if you're not familiar with us, is a 501c3 organization that raises funds in support of the Forest Preserve District of Will County. And we fund conservation, nature education, and recreation programs and initiatives. Um, one of the things that we also do is we offer these native plant seminars and our native plant sales. That's a big emphasis um, for us in addition to funding a lot of different um, programs and services like special art exhibitions, we fund natural area restoration projects, um, nature education programs for school children, um, different recreational programs like a woods walk challenge where people um, hike 10 different trails during the fall season. Um, we have two grant programs. We fund volunteer stewards that do all of the restoration work in the forest preserves, and we have a grant program for them, and also a youth service um, grant as well for, especially for Eagle Scouts that like to do projects. So we kind of um, try to hit a wide range of programs and services and um, enhance what the Forest Preserve uh, District of Will County is able to offer. If you're not at all sure where the Forest Preserve District of Will County is, uh, it's located in jo the Joliet area. So um, just a little bit southwest of Chicago. <laughs> if you are joining, make sure you mute your mic because um, we can hear all your conversations, <laughs> just so you know. Um, one thing I do wanna kind of give you a heads up on, um, we've got uh, a seminar coming up with Heather Home on bees and beneficial insects that's already on our website for registration, but we're going to be putting up two more um, later, on in, later on this year. They'll be come, uh, being launched on the website in the coming weeks. So one of them is Asters and Goldenrods, Autumn's Pollinator, Pollinator Banquet in um, on June 10th, it's tentative right now, but we'll be firming that up. And then we'll have healthy yards replacing invasive shrubs in your landscape with native species. And Melissa from the Morton Arboretum is going to join us. Um, we also have two more plant sales coming up this year. Um, our spring sale sold out in record time. Um, we ended up selling over 12,000 native plugs. So that's um, pretty astounding. We did not expect that kind of response. So if you shopped our sale, thank you so much for your support. And we're really excited to get our plants very soon. <laughs> um, and that brings me to our session tonight with Drew Lakeland, beautiful to wildlife, beautiful to people, landscaping with native, native plants to support nature. Um, Drew, uh, his company Creating Sustainable Landscapes has um, been in existence for about 10 years and he's been working with native plants in the landscape setting for nearly 20 years. One of the things that um, 
attracted me to offering a native plant seminar with, with Drew was his Facebook page, Creating Sustainable Landscapes. Uh, if you have not checked it out, if you're on Facebook, definitely check it out. Uh, because I think one of the most helpful things he does is he shares before and after shots. He shares pictures of the gardens. And if you're anything like me, having a visual of how some of the plants are placed and what works well together is, is just about the best thing that could possibly be. Um, so that's, that's been one of the most amazing things. So I'm Drew, thank you so much for, for agreeing to um, share your years of knowledge and experience with us. I think everyone's really excited. And I'm gonna stop my share so we can go on to Drew's presentation. All right, well, thank you, Cindy. You can see my screen, correct? You can see the, the slide, right? Yes. Very good. Well, thank you for everybody for attending and um, I'm pleased to be here talking with you. As you can see from the pre-settlement maps behind me, uh, I'm in Michigan. I'm in Southeast Michigan, just outside Ann Arbor. And um, as Cindy said, I've been running my business for about 10 years now. Uh, we, do, we, we only work with native plants. Uh, we do things like pollinator gardens with natives and prairie gardens, and um, we'll do rain gardens, um, bio bioengineered uh, natural shorelines. Um, I also do landscape design using using natives and, and consults. And I've just been over the last few weeks with COVID um, experimenting with doing those remotely by FaceTime or Zoom. And, and so far they seem to have been, been working out. So um, I'm available for people to do that as well. So um, I think that's enough of the shameless advertising and I'm gonna begin. So um, the title of my talk is Beautiful the People and Beautiful or Beautiful the Wildlife, Beautiful the People. And I'm going to talk about um, landscaping with native plants. I'm, I'm first going to talk about um, the, 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 the issues and the problems that we're facing with our landscapes. I'm going to talk about some ecology. Um, about that, I'm also going to talk about some of the ecology of native plants. And then I'm going to talk about some on the ground uh, principles that you can use in using native plants in your landscape. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about some design considerations and I'm gonna talk about some management considerations. And then I'm gonna finish by showing you pictures of wildlife that have shown up in my quarter acre in my sterile solar suburb. So with that, um, so with that, my slides won't advance. Let me try it this way. All right. So um, back in November of 2018, the New York Times had an article about the insect apocalypse and how insect populations were, are crashing uh, all around the world, but also here in, in North America. That was followed up by an article in February of 2019 in The Guardian that talked about the fact that at the current rate we're going, we're likely to wipe out insects uh, within the next 100 years and the dire consequences of doing that. Um, then, then later that year, there was an article in uh, the New York Times talking about a study in the Journal of Science that highlighted the fact that over the last 50 years, basically since 1970, in North America, we've lost almost 30% of our birds. And then there was a study highlighted in the Washington Post um, um, from the UN's Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And yes, that's written in front of me in my notes because I don't know how they come up with names like that, but it talks about the fact that uh, across the planet, um, 
uh, a million species of plants and animals face extinction. And so many of you have probably heard about the uh, Anthropocene and um, basically our transition from the Holocene to a um, era on the planet dominated by humans. Many of you have maybe heard about the sixth extinction. And um, in North America, uh, these are some of the, the losses that we are facing um, of animals and, and, and plants as well. <clears throat> and the major causes of those are really development and agriculture. And um, they, they have secondary effects such as the use of pesticides, the loss of native plants, uh, invade the introduction of native species, climate change, and light pollution. So if you look at a satellite photo of the United States at night, you can get a sense of how much land we have gobbled up, particularly east of the Mississippi River. And on that land is a lot of lawn, and we add a lot more lawn every day. And on that lawn, it's, it's highly intensive. It's it's completely unsustainable, requires a lot of pesticides. Uh, there is a lot of carbon pollution that is um, introduced into the air from, from the mowing and a lot of our municipal water that, that, that we pull out of the lake or a river, cling to drinking water standards and just throw it on the ground. Um, so, you know, there's some statistics on, on development. And then food production now claims half of the Earth's land surface. And we certainly need to eat, um, but there are probably smarter ways to do that. Um, in the United States, we are converting the last of our grasslands to row crops at, at a, a rate um, faster, at the fastest rate in, in about a century. And it's mostly due to ethanol subsidies and crop insurance that incentivize farmers to grow crops on marginally productive land because they know they, they'll, get, they'll get payouts um, for, for their crops when they fail, um, even though it's on land that probably should not be converted to row crops. Additionally, uh, we, we're introducing invasive plants and so a third of the vegetation or natural areas are invasive species. And, um, you know, by food and by accident, but really a great deal, the majority of it is from ornamental plants uh, brought to you by big horticulture. So here's a picture of a open, healthy woodlands that I took in the thumb of Michigan managed with, with fire. And here is a buckthorn thicket that um, under which nothing else will grow because um, the buckthorn leaves out early, it uh, keeps its leaves late and uh, can outcompete everything there. Uh, the, the picture on the left is one I took of honeysuckle in a woodlands in Ohio. And um, honeysuckle leaves out very early. And so our spring ephemerals in our forests um, need a lot of sunlight and they get a lot of sunlight because uh, the trees have not leafed out yet. But honeysuckle leaves out very early, shades the woodland floor and doesn't allow for enough light to, to, to hit the floor and support our spring ephemerals. And then of course there's garlic mustard that um, is allelopathic and puts a chemical into the soil <clears throat> that will um, kill the mycorrhizal um, fungi that attach to the roots of native plants that allow for the uptake of nutrients. So it is actively killing plants. And so invasive species are able, because they don't have predators, um, are, are able to outcompete our native vegetation for water, light, nutrients, and space. And we, we spend a lot of tax dollars to manage and, and control that. So here's a picture of um, Phragmites in a wetland, and you can see that it has outcompeted everything. And so there's a near complete loss of biodiversity. Adding to that, big horticulture has um, brought in alien ornamental species that sometimes carry diseases that 
our native plants don't have defenses for. So um, somebody, you know, a bunch of people thought that it was a great idea to bring in Asian chestnuts that all but wiped out the most abundant tree in the Appalachian chain because of a fungus that came along with it. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of Dutch elm disease and there's dogwood and thracnose that comes in and kusa dogwood. Um, and, and, and this is one I just don't get because our native dogwood, Cornus Florida, is uh, you, you just can't improve on it. But, but, um, the, 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 but big horticulture has brought this plant in and it's a fungus that our native dogwoods cannot, cannot, um, cannot fight off. <clears throat> um, on foreign nursery stock is a fungus that, um, that came that uh, brings sudden oak disease. It's, it's a fungus that can get in a cut in, in the bark of an oak tree, particularly red oaks, and it can kill an oak tree within uh, two to three weeks and then spread by roots to adjoining oak trees. So the bottom line is that between 95 and 97% of the original US land mass has been cut, plowed, or paved. Uh, so that meaning only three to 5% of it is, is undisturbed. And um, in, in flatter places like Michigan and in, in Illinois, there's probably much less than that. That, that three to 5% is enhanced uh, we, we can get up that high because of the mountainous regions in along the Appalachians and in the West. So in, in places like Michigan and Illinois, um, there's, there's, there's probably much less than 95 to 97% or there's much less than three to 5% undisturbed land. So this is the definition of the problem. And, and this is why we've lost 30% of our birds over the last 50 years and other plant and animal species as well. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, some ecology. <clears throat> so I assume all of you like birds and the question is what are they eating in the spring? And so um, you can see that this, this, um, this Nashville warbler is eating a caterpillar and um, birds are eating a lot of caterpillars and feeding their young caterpillars in the spring. So when you look at this chickadee, it will only go 50 yards for caterpillars to feed its young. And in those 50 yards, it needs between 350 and 570 every day. So if you do the math over about 16 days, that's between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars needed to raise its clutch. And that is all within a 50 yard radius. So think about, this is just one chickadee nest. So now think about two chickadee nests and a robin's nest and a wren and a cardinal and a nuthatch. And you, you get a sense for how many caterpillars are needed to feed their young. And so like, like this, this chickadee, 96% of our ter terrestrial bird species feed their young caterpillars. And they do that because caterpillars have a lot of protein uh, for birds, for baby birds to grow up fast. And they need to grow up fast because the longer they're in the nest, the more they're sitting targets for prey. But it's not just birds that are feeding their young insects. Lots and lots of things need insects from skunks to even black bears and opossums and spiders and frogs and toads. So you, you get a sense for just how important insects are for feeding wildlife. They're, they're the, the second trophic level that, that feed, feed higher trophic level animals. So a world without insects is a world without bio, biological diversity. And it's the collapse of insects that are causing the, the collapse in higher order animals and, and the disappearance of them. So that begs the question, what do, what do insects eat? And insects, um, for the most part, are, are eating plants. I know there are insects that bite you, you know, mosquitoes are, are the bane of our existence, but for the most part, they're eating, eating plants. 
And in fact, 38% of all animal species worldwide are herbivorous insects. And so since plants can't get up and run away, um, plants have evolved certain other defense mechanisms to protect themselves. So things like thorns on roses will protect, will protect uh, roses from larger animals. Um, lignans and grasses make grasses unpalatable and chemical toxins uh, are, are um, a, another defense mechanisms that plants have evolved to protect themselves. And chemicals are the most common defense for plants. Uh, bitter tastes, some of them are toxic and some of them reduce the digestibility of them. So if you think about an onion, for example, uh, God didn't put an onion on this planet for us to uh, cut up and put in, a, put in a frying pan. What an onion does to your sinuses and your eyes is actually a chemical defense to keep things from eating it. Uh, so the same with mints and lemons. And if you go around as trees and, and plants are starting to, to leaf out and, and grow up and start to taste them, you find most of them taste pretty bad. And, and so these are, are chemical defenses to keep, to keep things from eating them. But yet many, many insects have evolved the capacity to eat plants. So let's, let's talk about the monarch um, because it's such a charismatic species and it has just such an incredible migration pattern. And as I'm sure many of you know, that although the, the, the adult monarch can take nectar from many plant species, the caterpillars can only eat milkweeds. They can't eat anything else. I don't know how many species of milkweeds are native in Illinois, but in Michigan, there are 11 species of milkweeds that are native and, and the caterpillar can eat any one of those native milkweeds. And um, I'm sure also many of you have ripped a, a milkweed leaf and seen that, that yellow sticky gooey sap come, come out of the leaf or the stem. And that, that sap it contains a, a toxin, it's a cardiac glycoside so an insect that may come by and chew on a milkweed will have its heart stopped. Now, if the insect does not, um, has, has, has adapted to that and is not killed by the sap, the gooey sap can, can um, gum up the eating parts and even drown an insect. So milkweeds have developed this double barrel defense. And yet, about three dozen species of insects have evolved to be able to get by these defenses. So when you look at this picture of these monarch caterpillars eating the milkweed leaf, what you don't see is the sap coming out of it. Um, so what the, the caterpillar does, it walks out to the petiole, which is that space between the leaf and the stem, and it'll chew the vessels that supply the sap to the leaf stopping the flow of sap. Now, the, the, the toxin is still in the leaf and the monarch is um, adapted to that and, and will not be killed by the toxin in the leaf, but it can get its, it can drown in, in the sap. So it has evolved this behavioral adaptation to be able to, to eat, eat milkweed. So um, it does not get, get um, drowned by the sap. And of course, I'm sure you've also heard that the loss of milkweed is the prime reason for monarch decline. And that happened in the early 2000s when Monsanto developed Roundup resistant uh, soybeans and, and corn and other crops so that it could sell more Roundup. Previously, farmers would, would have to uh, till in between the, 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 their rows of crops to control weeds, but milkweeds would survive that and grow. Um, but it was the introduction of Roundup resistant GMO crops that, that then allowed farmers to spray their fields with Roundup. And when that happened, we saw milkweed populations decline and we saw monarch populations crash as well. 
Um, so like the monarch, about 90% of our insects are specialists and eat a very narrow range of, of plants. The monarch can eat any milkweed. And, and as I said, there, there, there are 11 species of milkweeds that are native in Michigan, but the, but the federally endangered carnivore blue butterfly has an even narrower range of plants that it can eat. It can only eat our um, native lupine, which is Lupinus perennis. And this is a prairie plant. And as you know, living in the prairie state, there isn't much prairie left there. And so as a result, there isn't much lupine, native lupine there. And so the Carner blue butterfly um, is on the endangered species list. And like those, those, those the, 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 the monarch and the Carner blue, many species of plants have very narrow ranges of plants. So the Hebrew will, as a caterpillar, will only eat the leaves of, of black gum. The fawn sphinx will only eat ash. The royal walnut moth, only walnuts and hickories. The witch hazel dagger moth, only witch hazels. And, and you will notice that many of these photos are courtesy of Doug Tallamy. Um, if, if you haven't read his books, do so, do read those. And he was uh, generous enough to share these slides with me. Well, insects, so insects can eat, eat their, their host plant when they've evolved certain adaptive mechanisms. The first is their ability to find their host plant. If you've ever watched the female monarch <clears throat> looking to lay her eggs, she will just flit around and flit around and flit around and then bam, land on a milkweed. So she has very good, good uh, plant ID skills. The second behavioral, the second adaptation is the ability to synchronize their life cycle with the appearance of their hosts. So monarchs are now migrating up through Mexico <clears throat> and it takes them about two to four generations to migrate here. And so they'll lay eggs, die, um, the legs on milkweeds die, and then those eggs need to go through their life cycle, and then they'll migrate farther north. And so as a general rule, monarchs are not migrating north faster than milkweeds are emerging from the ground. So, you know, we're about the same latitude, and we generally won't see milkweeds emerging from the ground until May. And we generally don't see, mil see monarchs here until then. A third a third adaptive mechanism are the physical and behavioral adaptations to be able to eat their hosts. So with the monarch that's snipping the petiole to stop the flow of sap, sap, that's a behavioral adaptation. And then the digestive enzymes to detoxify the plant chemicals that the, the, they're consuming in their host plants. And these evolutionary processes take thousands of years to occur. And so what that means is that those 90% of insects that eat a very narrow range of plants generally can only eat native plants, the, the plants that they have a long co-evolutionary history with um, since the melting of glaciers about 10,000 years ago. And it's the leaves that feed the young. Um, butterfly bush sold to us by big horticulture as supposedly great for, for monarchs is, is um, is, is pretty far from the truth. Um, although butterflies will eat the nectar of butterfly bush, um, butterfly bush is from China and it has chemical defense, defenses that allow for exactly zero species of caterpillars to eat it. So it begs the question, why feed the adults when you're starving the kids? Imagine sitting down at the dinner table with your kids, pulling up or your grandkids and pulling up the dinner platter and shoveling some food off the platter and turning to the kids and saying, sorry, you can't eat. And, and that, that's a good metaphor for butterfly bush. And we are starting to recognize that it is, an, it is becoming an invasive species. So no argument for me, it's a beautiful plant, but, but beautiful only to humans and not to, not to wildlife because um, our insects have not had enough evolutionary time to be able to get past the chemical defenses in this plant. And it's that leaf chemistry that is the most difficult to overcome. 
And it's likely going to take thousands of years before insects can use butterfly bush as a host plant. So it's spring now, um, the, ground, the ground is thawed and I, I fully encourage everybody who has butterfly bush to go out and dig it up this coming weekend. Um, oak trees are, are great plants for, for, um, for Lepidoptera. And so I took this picture of a uh, open grown white oak, beautiful tree. It looks healthy and it is healthy. But when you get up close to it and look at the leaves in the summer, you find that they're torn and they're tattered and they're eaten. And this is a good sign because it's telling us that this oak tree is, is using, um, it is being used by, by insects as a, a, a host plant. So um, here in Michigan and the East Coast, um, oaks support more, more species of Lepidoptera, that's, that's uh, moths and butterflies than any other species. I don't know if it's number one in Illinois, if it's not, maybe, maybe birch or willow might be, but it's certainly in the, in the top three. So when you landscape using non-native plants, you don't have insects. Here is a list of the usual suspects. Um, boxwoods are very common, a very common landscape plant. They only support one species of insect. Forsythia, about ready to bloom, only supports one species of insect. And so um, compare that to the number of species of insects supported by native plants and there's no, there's no, um, no comparison. Doug Tallamy in, in his southeastern Pennsylvania yard did a little formal study. Um, he counted the number of species and the number of caterpillars of each species on his uh, oak tree just at head height. He went around he, he can ID those, I, I can't, and many of us can't. And, and this is what he came up with on July 25th of 2014. On the next day, he moseyed over to his neighbor's yard with the Bradford pear and found one caterpillar at head height. Um, additionally, the, there are huge nutritional differences in the berries between native berries and non-native berries. And, and that difference is fat content. And, and the, the, the native species, many of the native species are producing berries high in fat in the fall, which is very important for migrating birds. They need high fat berries to be able to, to make their migration. Whereas our non-native invasive species are very low in fat and very high in sugar. And the birds will eat those if they have to uh, but they'd rather not um, because it, it won't get them very far. So the bottom line is that native plants produce four times more insect biomass, <clears throat> three times the insect species, 13 times more caterpillar species, and 35 times the caterpillar biomass. That's 3,500% more caterpillar biomass produced by native plants than non-native plants. <clears throat> so in summary, we use native plants because of habitat. Plants being the only thing that, convert the en that can convert the energy of the sun into biomass. And when you have native plants, it feeds the 90% 90, 90 of insect species that can only eat native plants, which in turn feeds the 96% of bird species that need, need insects to, um, to, to raise their young um, and other plant, other animals as well that need insects and the things that eat the things that eat the insects. So this heron may not eat insects, but its food source needs insects. And so this heron is just as dependent on insects, even though it does not directly eat them. Bees are picky eaters as well. Our indigenous bees are four times more likely to take nectar from native plants than non-native plants. And 20% of our 
native bees are monoelectric or oligoelectric, which means they'll take nectar from only one or a very few species of, of plants. I don't, I don't know how many species of bees are native in Illinois. It's probably the, pretty close to in Michigan. We have 400 species of bees, uh, native bees in Michigan, and about 80 of those require a specific host plant to take nectar. And, and here's the thing about native plants is they can tolerate the sub-zero temperatures we get in the winter, the inevitable summer heat and drought and insects eating them. And they can do that without, um, with much reduced or even eliminated supplemental water, fertilizer and spraying. They've been doing that on their own for 10,000 years and um, they don't need us to do that. And they can do that because of their root systems. So there on the far left is the root system of turf grass four inches deep. And there are all the prairie plants that have root systems that are three, five, 10, and in some cases, 15 feet or more deep. So when it's hot and dry, these plants are able to suck water from deep within the ground and may not even know that it's dry out. So here's a picture of my front yard in a drought year. My, my sprinkler system hasn't, hasn't worked in about six or seven years. And so you can see the turf grass going dormant. But if you look at the perennials in the beds, you can see that they're green and lush. And that's because they're able to get water from deep within the ground. So the advantages of using native plants in our landscapes is increased habitat, um, that, that I hopefully have demonstrated from, from, um, from plant to insect and up the food chain. And um, I get a lot of joy at seeing all the wildlife in my, my yard. And, um, additionally, you can reduce or eliminate inputs such as water and fertilizers, uh, which lowers your water and sewer bills. Um, you can eliminate chemicals, which um, saves you money and of course makes it healthier for wildlife, you, your kids, your grandkids, and your pets. Yet we still, the dominant paradigm is to landscape with plants from other ecoregions um, in North America and from around the world. And um, this yard is a wasteland. There is nothing there for insects to eat and supports almost no wildlife. But big horticulture is a is a big is a big industry, and you've got things like the prover the proven winners brands, um, and um, we need to be shifting from from those these unsustainable plants that even they will admit you know that you look at the tag and it tells you watering um, needs, whereas the our native plants. Um, don't don't need all of those inputs and are much sustainable and are much more sustainable. And and so as as part of using plants from other continents, our landscapes are lacking the layers that you find out in the wild. You know, from from the canopy of a forest to the shrub layer to the herbaceous layer, and and here's uh, on the top left how we. What, what we've turned, um, you know, we have, we have more forest in Michigan than, than you do in Illinois, but um, this is what we're turning our, our forests into, um, landscapes with no layers. One day I was driving along and I said, oh, cool, look at that, wild oak meadows. There's a big bur oak out in front, it's on wild oak lane, and I go in and it is neither. Here's a picture I took of Acorn, the intersection of Acorn Trail and Overlook Trail. There is not a trail there that produces an acorn and the overlook is into a mode detention basin. It's, it's post-apocalyptic. Here is North Ridge Woods and you can see a little bit of woods in the back, but the woods used to be right here. And here is in where I live, the um, new development called Heritage Woods. And so you may have noticed that, that developers um, name the subdivisions that they're building after what they've destroyed and are probably getting some consulting help on, on naming 
their, their developments from, from the company George Orwell and Associates. So we have landscapes without nature. We're using non-native plants. Um, we don't have layers. And the, the paradigm and what we've always been taught, um, and, and, and I'll, I'll say that everything we've learned about landscaping is wrong. Um, we've been taught that the only good insect is a dead insect. We've been taught to kill insects, you know, when, when one shows up to pull out the, the spray and to kill them. We're taught to select plants that are pest free, which is code for plants from other continents with chemical defenses that don't allow for any insects to eat them. So we have, we live in landscapes that um, with few insects. So again, to review, Native plants support those 90% of insects that can only eat natives and the 96% of birds that feed their young, young insects and other animals and up the food chain. And so when we landscape um, using non-native plants, we are driving out the insects and driving out the higher order wildlife. Um, so now let's shift gears again and talk about the new landscape paradigm, the, the one that I'm practicing and increasingly people are practicing and maybe many of you are practicing or at least have um, an awareness of the problem and, and are wanting to uh, landscape in a different way. It starts with the assumption that nature no longer is, is just something out there and we can do whatever we want in our in our home landscapes. Um, our natural areas are no longer large enough to support wildlife as evidenced by the, the crashes in, in, in wildlife. So the front lines in the battle for nature are now in, in, in our front yards, our backyards, our schools, our industrial parks. And now we become the ecological warriors of the future as, as homeowners and landscape architects and teachers and we can do this in a very apolitical way. Um, oftentimes we generally think, you know, to be an ecological warrior, you have to join the Sierra Club or the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, groups with certain political bents that may or may not align with yours. Um, but landscaping with native plants is a completely apolitical kind of, of activity. And I have clients that, that are, are, are so far on the left that it'll astound you and so far on the right that it'll astound you as well. And, and I just, just hold my breath and, and help them move, move along. And so our plantings can't just be ornamental anymore. They, they also have to clean our stormwater and uh, serve as a genetic reservoir for diversity. Um, a 2012 study by the U.S. Department of Agriculture Economic Department of Agriculture Economic Research Service talked about their 100 million acres of residential land, and this is why Doug Tallamy talks about the homegrown nat national park. You can there, there's 100 million acres of residential land that are now being landscaped mostly without layers and with non-native plants that if we con converted those, um, we'd have more land supporting wildlife than all of our national parks combined. So in the past, we would think about landscaping mostly from this vantage point of decorate, decorative value. And we need, now need to shift that to um, um, supporting food webs and and uh, creating pollinator habitat. But we, we, we also certainly don't want to lose the decorative value. And, and we work very hard in making our clients' landscapes beautiful as well. Well, let's talk some about some, some principles of landscaping with native plants. And I'm going to talk about design principles. And I'm going to talk about management principles. So let's start with design. The first is to match plants to the conditions in which they evolved. I'm going to take my jacket off because it is getting hot in this room. The heat just turned on and the door is closed. And so it is hot in here. Um, so the first is to match plants 
to the conditions in which they evolved. Um, we always had sandy soil, loamy soil, clay soil, wet and dry, sun, sun and shade, and all combinations of those. And plants evolved, plants, plants grew in, in all of those niches. And so what you want to do is match the plant to the conditions in which it evolved. So you look at this picture of butterfly weed and just look how crappy that soil is. And this is a small plant and it's, it's green and lush in this very sandy soil because although it's only 18 inches tall, it has a 10 foot deep taproot. So it doesn't know it's dry. Um, but if you read a gardening magazine or a gardening book or have a traditional landscaper come over, they will tell you that they, they, they will tell you, oh, you, you can't grow anything in the soil. You need to amend the soil. And nothing could be farther from the truth. Um, this plant is doing well. And I can give you 30 species of landscape worthy native plants that will do great in soils like this. Um, and yet while this plant will do great in this soil, it won't stand a chance here or vice versa. And um, sometimes we have the opportunity to plant in standing water and my crew draws straws on who's going in the water, but you can be darn sure it's not me. Um, here is a picture of my pond in my backyard. This is an early May picture. And here is marsh marigold. And it is in, um, it is in very mucky soil. In fact, you look at the other side of the pond, that marsh marigold is actually growing in standing water. And if I pull this plant a foot back, it will die because the soil will be too dry. It needs and requires wet soil. And in fact, if you look behind, look way back, you will see that there's standing water in there. It's a boggy area I've created by running my sump pump into my pond and it overflows into there. So here's a later picture from the other side of that. And you see all of the plants growing in there. There's Rebecca fulgida and cardinal flower and blue lobelia and, and brown fox sedge and red twig dogwood and river birch. And all of these plants require wet soils. And so I'm just using plants that, that um, are doing well in those soils. So when you match plants to the conditions in which they evolve, you don't need to amend soil. So it saves you money and time and, and work. You don't need to change the drainage patterns because if you have a wet area, you're going to use wetland plants. And then of course, that results in reduced maintenance because of, of, um, of you, you don't have to water. So that's the first principle. The second principle is the plant in masses and drifts to cover all of the soil so that you provide um, a lot of competition for weeds by packing the plants in tight. And um, so it, you, you look at this, this is at the Kresge Foundation in Troy, Michigan, um, landscaped all with native plants. And you can see that they are, they are packed in tight. They are not a horticultural planting where you have plant mulch, plant mulch. And you look at that and you go, gee, do they hate plants or something? So, um, the, 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 um, by doing them in masses, you, you have weed suppression, you can eliminate mulch, and you get, you get the, the landscape to look legible. Here is a client's planting, and you could see the prairie drop seed, the grass there in a mass, and you can see the ferns to the left, and in front you can see irises. And if I walk forward 10 feet and turn to the right and go up 20 feet, um, this is that at an earlier time in the year. This is prairie smoke in a mass and a drift, in, in, in large mass and drift. And so very legible, very tightly packed, weed resistant. Here's another picture of pickerel weed on the right and prairie drop seed on the left. Um, very, you know, quite beautiful. And, and you, can, you can see how this is designed and laid out. And the other interesting thing about this is the pickerel reed on the weed on the right is actually in standing water and the prairie drop seed on the left is high and dry. Here is retibita around a client's mailbox. 
This is the side of my house with wild bergamot and echinacea, um, two plants that co-evolved and play well together. Um, that one plant by itself doesn't look all that spectacular, but when combined together, it looks great. When you plant in masses and drifts, it's easier for an insect to find its host, and so it expends less energy. You have greater cross-pollination. The landscape is legible. You can eliminate mulch because the plants are competitive against weeds. You have less weeding, you have textures, and you're building communities of plants that coexisted in nature. Another principle is to layer vegetation. So we always had, so again, you, you saw this earlier, the, the overstory, the midstory, and the herbaceous layer. And um, so I talked about earlier, there are more than 500 species of Lepidoptera that eat oaks, but 94% of them pupate in the soil or in leaf litter. And so it's not enough to say, oh, I have oak trees and plant lawn underneath them because those 94% of those more than 500 species of Lepidoptera that go through their last life cycle in, on the ground are going to get mowed. So you, gotta, you, you have to underplant with, with an herbaceous layer. And so um, there's my river, my river birch that you know, is growing and will become the canopy layer. And there's the, the shrub layer with the red twig dogwood and the herbaceous layer. So as, as um, caterpillars drop out of the tree, they have a place to hide and can go through their, their, um, the, the rest of their life cycle. Um, and, and also here's another example of that underneath an oak tree. So the benefits of layering is you mimic those natural, the, the, those natural settings and, and you also provide those benefits for wildlife that um, cross layers. Another principle is to limit lawn only to areas that need it, lawn, lawns or wastelands. And so legitimate uses for lawn are play spaces to kick a ball around, pathways to walk, uh, for boundaries to provide a buffer, and a spillover area for, for entertainment. Here's an aerial photo of my house. Um, my neighbors have a lot of lawn, um, but you can see in my front yard, um, who, who uses the front yard for entertainment or kicking a ball around? So you can see there that I have two rain gardens and some perennial beds in the back. You can see in the back corner of my yard, there's the, there's the pond area. And I do have a little more lawn in the back because my patio can't handle, it isn't large enough if we have you know, two or three couples or, or a party at our house. Um, pains me to mow it, um, but, but we have a little bit more, more lawn in the back. Here's a picture of my neighbor's front yard. Here's a picture of my front yard. And you can see the border of grass between the sidewalk and that, that perennial bed. And here you can see the pathway through, through the front yard, yard to walk. And I make, them, I make them four or five feet wide so two people can, can, um, can walk through that side by side. Here's a client's house that we landscaped. This was a new house. And uh, the only grass there are the pathways uh, to walk. Another landscape principle is to provide flowers across the growing season. Um, one, people like to see that. And two, um, 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 pollinators like to see it as well. And then you get the, the dy the dyna the, 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 that dynamic element of seeing colors uh, translate. So um, here is a lawn extension we did for a client. And so um, I will note to you now that the next two pictures are gonna show this lawn extension from the same vantage point. This is a picture of, in May, of Harry, um, Harry Penstemon or Harry Beard Tongue. Here's a July picture of butterfly weed. And here's a September picture of of Black Eyed Susan. So May, July, and September, all from the same vantage point. 
Here is a front yard we did for somebody. This is an early July picture. You can see the yarrow and the butterfly weed. And here it is a month later. And the echinacea has, has come in and the retibita has come in. Another landscape principle is formal in the front and wild in the back um, you know, for community, for community uh, standards. Um, here is my front yard. I consider this formal uh, because the plants are in masses and drifts. I have borders, I have, I have pathways, um, but this is behind my house, completely wild, done by seed, um, beyond the lawn area in my house back behind my house. Here's the front of a house. Um, we did very formally. We just put in a monoculture of prairie drop seed. Um, but here's the back of the house done completely wild. Um, and here's another vantage point of that. Um, another principle is wild in large spaces. And you, that, that, you know, I, I'm sure you all go out into the country and see people who have five acres of lawn that they mow every week. It's just crazy. Um, that, that is the new definition of eco-terrorism. And so um, if you have a wild, wild area, you do, um, you do it by seed. And um, here is the, I'm sure many of you have been to the Chicago Botanical Garden. I took this a number of years ago, the Chicago Botanic Garden. This is the house of the president of Bowling Green State University in Ohio. This is the back 40 of a friend of mine and another picture of that. Additionally, don't forget about grasses and sedges. Um, they're great because they maintain their form and structure over the winter. Here is little blue stem. Here is little blue stem in my yard in the fall. And if you get it backlit just right, you can see the uh, white seed heads. And here it is in the winter where um, it maintains its form and structure much better than perennials do. Here is the side of my driveway in September with prairie drop seed. Here it is in November with, with dew on it. And here it is in December with the hoarfrost on it. So, um, so same form and shape, but just um, different kinds of views at different times of year, the year. You've seen this picture of using prairie drop seed. This is a lawn extension we did. This is a um, parking lot bioswale we did with just with four species of sedges. All right. Another design principle is used to demonstrate intentionality. So a sign that lets people know uh, borders of grass and rock, cairns may you know, demonstrate that if this is intentional, some sculpture, and then of course, walls, hedges, and fences. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about management. When you plant in dense drifts and masses and you layer, you, there's, there's much less weeding. You don't have to mulch. Um, put the right plant in the right place, no supplemental water. And then you just edit to preserve the legibility. So as plants move around, um, editing, I, I use the word editing instead of weeding. Um, so a principle of management is to leave your leaves um, because in those leaves are shelter for eggs, larvae, and adults of, of butterflies, and some butterflies even overwinter as adults. Um, and it adds organic matter to the soil. So you, you, you're going to grow your native plants in the summer, and um, you, you, you need to provide places. It's, it's a 12-month thing. You need to provide places for wildlife in the non-growing season as well. Um, there's the luna moth cocoon wrapped in the leaves. If you rake your leaves away, you are getting rid of this beauty. Um, also, along the theme of everything you've learned about landscaping is wrong, do not cut your plants down in the fall because in, in the hollow stems and in the leaf litter uh, or, or in the stubble, 
uh, insects are going to overwinter. And of course, the seeds are an important source of food for birds in the winter. And then in the spring, you're only going to cut to 15 inches high um, because, um, and you're going to wait. It's still too early because the, the insects haven't emerged. But you're only going to cut to 15 inches because in those hollow stems, um, uh, bees can lay eggs. In this picture, um, Heather, Heather Holm gave it to me. And I'm using it with her permission. And she's going to talk about bees soon. Um, and she'll talk about stubble. <clears throat> And then when you cut, just drop it. It's gonna provide more nutrients to the soil and very quickly as in the area on the, the same area on the right a few weeks later, the plants are gonna grow up around it and hide that as well. And so um, of course, never any pesticides, little to no watering, no fertilizing, no mulching. And then, and then um, use motion detector lights. Um, you know, lights, lights have a security purpose, but um, most birds in the spring and fall migrate at night and leaving lights on at night confuses them. So, so use motion detector lights. So to finish up, um, um, I'm gonna show pictures and, and videos of wildlife that has shown up at, in my yard. You saw that aerial photo. I live in a very sterile soulless suburb. And, but yet in my little quarter acre, um, I've attracted a lot of wildlife. So here is a bumblebee on, on, um, on wild bergamot and on swamp milkweed and on echinacea. Here is a bumblebee on bottle gentian. Um, this is a closed flower in my front yard rain garden. And only it is strong, only our native bumblebees are strong enough to open it and, and pollinate it. So this is going on, on um, this is going on every sunny September afternoon. Gulp. And here is my New England aster in October. And just look at all the bees on it. So this is beekeeping, providing providing flowers and, and nectar sources for bees. Um, beekeeping, in, in my mind, is not building a structure and importing a uh, European, a non-native European bee. Um, I, I don't quite know how we got the idea that, that, that honeybees is, is saving bees. Um, and then while I was there, that guy showed up. There is a um, yellow sulfur. Here is a great black wasp on my swamp milkweed. This is actually a very docile wasp. I can pet it while it's, it's nectaring. You can see a... So this is going on while that's in flower. Because I have a pond, um, I also have dragonflies. Here is a clear wing hummingbird moth nectaring on my swamp milkweed. That's actually a moth. This is in one of my front yard rain gardens. Here is a spice bush swallowtail caterpillar on the left, eating um, the leaves of my spice bush, great shade medium to moist soil, sh um, medium sized shrub. And there's the adult on the right, but I wouldn't have that adult if I didn't have a spice bush there for, for the caterpillar. And of course I have milkweeds and I'm raising monarchs. And this video doesn't do justice to um, all the monarchs on this September afternoon. Uh, Leatris is a great species for, for, for um, monarchs to get nectar for their long, their long, long journey down to Mexico. There are about 10 monarchs flying around there this September. And here is a, um, 
um, the name escapes me of the of the the moth that that's the caterpillar of. Um, but there's there are milkweed beetles as well. Um, I I don't know what that scary looking thing is on my spice bush, but it it's eating it and that thing on my wild bergamot. But those those hairs coming out tell me not to touch. And here's a cicada on my little blue stem. And here's a boy frog in my pond um, that just showed up. And there, there are a number of them. Um, and it's making a lot of noise. It's looking for a woman. And when it does that, you get toad porn. And when you get that, you get babies. And in addition to that, uh, green frogs showed up. They just showed up. And they're breeding as well. And there's a ruby-throated hummingbird in my getting nectar from my cardinal flower in my front yard rain garden. And here's a morning dove coming for a drink. Even had a blue heron show up. Um, 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 yeah, that guy. He, it's it's late in the day. Um, goldfinches eating seeds. Here's a robin coming for a bath and a Nashville warbler. And Mr. and Mrs. Duck just came back again. They've been coming back every March and April since 2016. Here is a robin um, eating high fat berries on, on my red twig dogwood. Even had a female belted kingfisher come and grab a goldfish out of my pond. And since I leave up my plants and the, and the seeds, there are dark eyed juncos. You might be able to see um, how the snow is darkened by the seeds. So um, this is my winter bird feeder. And of course, since I have a lot of songbirds around, I also have Cooper's hawks and I regularly watch them hunt for songbirds and, and other things as well. Um, and then if you have space for a brush pile, put in a brush pile. It's a great place for birds to hide in the storm. And who else knows, who knows what else is living in there? But it could be possums that are showing up in my yard and raccoons. And because of that, uh, I regularly have coyotes and I'm regularly picking up coyote poop in my yard. So, um, from plants to insects to birds and up the food chain um, on my little quarter acre in, in a suburb. So to conclude, if insects were to disappear, most flowering plants would go extinct, our food webs would collapse, and humanity would be doomed. So you can start by ripping out everything and starting all over, and I highly recommend that. Um, but it may be more than you can do financially and effort wise. So then just take out a little lawn every year and add a perennial bed or a rain garden or take an existing perennial bed and flip it. Or at the other end of the spectrum, just vow to replace anything that dies with a native plant and you'll be moving forward. One of Doug Tallamy's grad students did a study in Washington DC and discovered that compared to um, native landscapes, yards that are dominated by introduced plants have 75% fewer caterpillars. They were 60% likely to have breeding chickadees with fewer eggs that were less likely to survive and de delayed maturation. There's this Native American proverb that says the land isn't ours, it's, it's our children's and we're merely borrowing it from them. And, um, and so it's incumbent upon us to return the land to our children in better condition than we found that. And I'm sure all of you, if you borrow a tool or borrow something from somebody, return it to them at least in as good condition as you found it and maybe better condition. And so there's a lot of things we can do to support, support our land and support our wildlife. Um, there are many things we can do, one of which 
um, that is very easy to do is to landscape with native plants. So I will entertain questions. I see there's one in the, in the chat. Can you plant a lower layer if the upper layer is already there? The answer is absolutely yes. And I'd assume you put in plants before the trees above have fully leafed out. I'm not quite sure I understand that, but um, put, put that lower layer in at any time. And um, whether it's before the leaves have leafed out or whatever, or in the fall, you know, because the next year you'll have that canopy layer and you'll have that layer below. I take it your neighbors weren't inspired to go native from your yard. I don't get it. My neighbors, my neighbors um, tell me it's beautiful. And then the neighbor right next to me hires an idiot landscaper who spent a couple thousand dollars and um, nothing native and it's ugly as sin. So go figure. Other questions? Um, you can you can unmute yourself for a question if you like, or put there it in the chat. I've got a couple questions that people were putting into the chat as you were speaking. Um, so one of them was in your front yard, you have, it was either a cup plant or maybe prairie duck in the middle of the garden. Prairie and duck. Is that, does that help to keep it from getting too aggressive or is that more of a structural um, garden element? It's a structural garden element. I, um, I could do a whole talk on, on design uh, of it. And so one of the things you do, um, and, and I recommend the book by Thomas Rainier and Claudia Vest called Planting in a Post Wild World. And they talk about having structural elements in there. And Prairie Dock is that structural element in that. Great. Um, someone also asked, when is it safe to spread native seeds collected from last year's plants? And they were looking specifically um, about bee balm, Monarda fistulosa, and royal catchfly, Selim regia. So the time to have done that was last fall because um, seeds need to go through winter in order to germinate. If you sow them now, a few may germinate, but most of them are gonna wait a year. If you think about it, they drop, plants drop their seeds in the fall. And if you get a warm spell and they germinate, they won't get through winter. So they've evolved a dormancy mechanism that is broken by an extended period of cold, moist conditions, also known as winter. In in, in the greenhouse, what they do is they'll take the seed, put it in damp sand in a plastic bag and throw it in the refrigerator for two months and trick the seeds into thinking they've gone through winter. So um, there are some species of seeds that don't need that stratification process. Uh, a, good place, a good source for learning which seeds will germinate immediately this spring and which ones Need, need that strat, that cold, moist stratification would be the catalog of Prairie Moon Nursery. It's a great resource. Um, another question, is the best way to get started by spreading seeds for host plants and nectar and see what comes up? And I'm assuming that may be opposed to planting the plants themselves. Well, so, so seeds are gonna take, take, a, take a while you sow them in the fall and, and it's a few years before they're, they mature. Seeds are really only appropriate when you're gonna do a wild planting and everything can be intermixed. Um, but, but if you want a more landscaped, um, formally planted bed, um, you really need to use plants. Great. Um, Cheryl commented that that, um, Caterpillar was from the milkweed tussock moth. That's right. <laughs> That's um, right. Thank you. <laughs> can sedge grass replace regular grass? Can what grass? Sedge. Can sedges yeah, replace can regular grass? Yeah, we did in a shady area last year a pen sedge lawn for somebody, Carrix Pennsylvanica. You know, it's not going to stand up to as much foot traffic. So, but you know, if you want a lawn, a lawn look and um, 
It's, it's not gonna have a gaggle of kids walking on it. Um, you can certainly use sedges for that, or you can use buffalo grass. I use buffalo grass. My lawn extension at my house is buffalo grass. Buffalo grass is not native in Michigan. In the Chicago area, you are on the Eastern fringe of buffalo grass being native. And so you can use buffalo grass as a lawn. It only grows five inches tall. Um, I have a patch of it, like I said, in my lawn extension. Um, it's been there for six years. It's never been mowed, um, but I do burn it every spring. Great. Um, there's a question from a person. How should I decide which native plants to put in my yard? So let's say you're a beginner. Um, maybe what would be some of the best um, native plants for beginners? Well, start, um, you know, there's some good Facebook pages like native plants of the upper Midwest or pollinator gardens. You, you're going to read, um, you, you know, talk with people at native plant nurseries. You know, you can go to your native, locally native plant nursery or your native plant sale and talk to people who are are experienced at that. There are some plants that are easier to grow and are tougher. There's some that are, are finicky. Um, so talk to people, Facebook pages uh, of groups that, that um, there, there are a number of Facebook groups and then, um, and then read up on them. Yeah, I think it's a lot of research. Um, it's research and talking to people. Yep, our uh, Nature Foundation website, willcountynature.org, we've got our Learn and Grow tab where you registered for this workshop. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, we've collected quite a few um, resources and we also have some of the native plant finders. So you put in your zip code or your region and it will generate a list of plants that are at least native for your particular area. But then, as Drew said, you do have to, um, you know, you have to understand your soil types, your light and moisture conditions too when you're picking them out. Yeah, so look at catalogs for that. Yeah. So I use a combination of like Prairie Moons catalog and Prairie Nursery. The one thing that I like about Prairie Nursery's catalog is for the plant species, they do soil types. There. So they'll tell you if it's if it like sandy soil or clay soil. Um, and then as you were mentioning, Cindy, the, the, the National Wildlife Federation, if you go to their website, you can you can plug in your zip code and it'll give you a list. Um, but you know, some of you may clay soils and some of you may have sandy soils. So don't just take that list. Understand what, what your light conditions are, what your moisture conditions are and what your soil conditions are. And if you cross-reference against all of those, you're gonna have a much higher success rate than if you try to plant something that likes sand and dry and put it in clay and wet. Correct. Um, Donna is asking, can you recommend a native plant for a dry shaded parkway? There's a linden that's casting heavy shade and the area is very dry. Um, so, um, wild geranium, um, eastern columbine, um, a lum root, um, pen sedge, um, something that flowers later in the season could be blue stem goldenrod or heart leaf goldenrod or big leaf goldenrod, uh, not goldenrod, heart leaf aster, big leaf aster. There, there are tons of things that'll do fine in a dry shaded area. Right. And those are just yeah. the fun. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, no, I'm done. I'm done. Okay. Uh, when, in terms of maintenance, when should you cut native plants in the spring? after the temperatures are regularly and re reliably in the 50s. So you're about the same as we are, I'm about the same latitude as you. Just yesterday, 
our average high temperature hit 50 degrees. Now, I know we've had some 60s and even a few days in the 70s. I think it's still too early. I wait until well into April when my wife is threatening me with divorce. <laughs> there are always other factors. Um, there are always other factors. <laughs> what I, I, would wait, I, I would wait as long as you possibly yeah. can. I've also heard, um, you know, if you do need to cut, especially in your in your front yard, you can cut, but leave everything there, and um, you know, as long as you can before cleaning up. Yep, yep, for sure. What's the best native drift for well-drained high shade area, or is there a good reference? Well-drained high shade. Um. Um, if your soil is loamy to sandy, pensage is great. Um, um, there, there's this concept of sociability of plants. Some plants you can put a lot of them together. Some are better as individual specimens. Um, so Jacob's Ladder would be good as a drift. While geranium would be good as a drift. Um, Carex, Carex, um, oh, the name escapes me. Um, I'll have to come back to that. But um, Carex Ebernia, Carex Ebernia, E B U R N E A. Uh, the common name is escaping me right now. Uh, Next. I don't know. Keep thinking on it while well, you're also answering some other questions. If you are looking for lists of native plants, definitely check out the plant finders. Um, go to our website. Uh, willcountynature.org, the learn and grow tab, and you will see several plant finders. Again, you put in your zip code and it will give you a list of native plants. Some right. of them will even let you sort them for pollinators or bird species. So definitely use that. Um, I have an area in the backyard that floods in the spring and is dry in midsummer. What should I plant there? <laughs> um. So many, many wetlands are, are very wet in the spring and dry out in the summer. So, you know, that might be called a wet mesic area. Um, and so many, many wetland plants will do fine in an area like that. And I just suggest that you consult a native plant catalog and look for plants that are either listed as wet mesic, M-E-S-I-C, or like, or like medium to wet conditions or wet, medium and dry conditions. Look for plants that span uh, from wet to dry. And, and there are many of those that, that uh, span wet to dry. Um, let's see. What were the group of four sedges that you used as a grass alternative in your client's front yard? Say that again, please. What were the group of four sedges that you used as a grass alternative in your client's front yard? Oh, I just used one species of grass. That was prairie drop seed, Sparabolus heteroleptus. But I could, have, I could have also used little blue stem either alone or in combination with those. I could have used Cytos grama, which is Budalua curtipendula, alone or in combination of those. I could have used blue grama, uh, which is Budalua, Budalua gracilis, um, in combination or alone with those. So, um, prairie drop seed, little blue stem, Cytos grama, blue grama. Great. Any tips for getting Liatris to grow? Um, boy, um, 
I, I, I have no trouble growing Liatris. I am pulling out Liatris all over the place as it, as it spreads. Um, so Liatris spicata likes it medium to moist. Liatris uh, scariosa uh, likes it kind of medium. Liatris cylindracea likes it really dry. And so um, the trick is to get the right liatris for, for the conditions you have. But um, liatris spicata, liatris spicata is it? Liatris, yeah, is, is, um, doesn't spread a lot, but liatris scariosa um, is, is weedy as all get out. You know, the one that I showed you with the monarchs on it, it it's all over the place. It's in my lawn, it's, it's, it's in all my beds. I, I treat it as a weed, I pull a lot of that out. Do you find that anything um, digs it up or eats the corms? Um, I, don't, I don't have any problems with that. I mean, I have deer and I have mice and I have rabbits. Um, that, that plant has been relatively bulletproof in terms of things eating it in my yard. But um, I, I will tell you that nothing, nothing will eat my echinacea in my yard. And I hear other people say, oh yeah, the deer just eat it to the ground. I have some woodland flocks or had woodland flocks in two different parts of my yard. And in one part, the rabbits ate it and killed it. In the other part of my yard, the rabbits wouldn't touch it. So um, I'm, 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 I'm almost nearly as clueless as you are. Sure. Sure, you mentioned a book, Planting in a Post. Could you repeat the book title? Sure, Planting in a Post Wild World. I'll show it to you. Great. Well, I can't find it. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, is buffalo grass um, something that you can, that native plant nurseries tend to have? And then how do you plant it in, in an already established lawn? Yeah, so nurseries mostly don't have it. I get mine from Todd Valley Farms in, they're in Nebraska. Um, you could do it by seed or you could do it by plugs. I usually do it by plugs um, and you have to kill the grass. You have to kill your turf grass first. I usually let the turf grass uh, grow long. Um, I herbicide it to kill it and then I burn it so that I get rid of all of that, that brown matter um, because buffalo grass spreads like strawberries does through through stolons and it needs bare soil as it spreads to put down roots. When you say plant in mass, how far are the plants on center? So I am general, I generally plant on one foot centers. Um, I'm putting the perennials on two foot centers though, and I'm mixing a grass or a sedge in with them. So I, in, in my plantings, half of what I put in is a grass or a sedge because the, the perennials come up like this and then there's space in between them, but a grass will tiller and a sedge will also and spread out and fill those spaces in between. Great. Um, milk, this person's milkweed gets covered in aphids and milkweed beetles. Is this harmful to the milkweeds? Um, so the aphids that you see on it are oleander aphids and um, so the milkweed beetle is no issue, the, the monarch caterpillar is no issue, um, you know the plant can survive you cutting it down uh, so you know it'll, it'll regenerate but the oleander aphids generally will not kill it 
but they are a Mediterranean species. And um, they, they also hold the toxin in them. And so that, that's their defense. So there isn't much that, that, that feeds on them. And they also, um, they can be some, come so numerous that they deplete the toxin in the plant and make it more palatable to other insects as well. But um, they generally don't kill the plant. You can, you can try just shooting it with a, um, a stream of water. Uh, rains usually help, um, but don't, don't use any insecticide because you're gonna kill good guys along with the bad, the bad guys. I wish there weren't oleander aphids, but they are. Um, we are approaching our eight o'clock cutoff, but I, I'm going to ask this one last question and there's still plenty of messages in the chat. We could probably keep Drew here for another <laughs> two hours answering your questions. Um, we will try to get them all answered. If not um, this evening, uh, I will go through the transcripts and see if we can find you an answer for some of your questions. Um, so the last one we'll take tonight is this person wants to desperately grow wild lupine, but they have clay. Is there anything they can do to get it going? Nope. <laughs> Quick answer. Nope. Yeah. Got to be, it has to be well-drained sandy soil. Yeah. We'll take okay. one more question since that was so oh, short. One more? Let's see. Um, I'm concerned about spring burn, burns killing insects in diapause and wildlife, especially uh, herps that can't escape. Isn't a burn as bad as herbicides? Um, so um, the, the short answer is no. I, I burn my beds, but I don't burn them every year. And yes, when I burn, I kill, kill those insects. Um, but I don't burn everything. So I burned all my front beds this past weekend, but I have a 2000 square foot prairie in the back. So it can repopulate. What, what the burning does is um, returns nutrients to the soil. It blackens the soil so that things start growing earlier. And what I find is by exposing the soil to sunlight, plants that have been uh, declining or have dropped out will start to germinate again. And so it, it actually increases biodiversity. So you, you, you got to break an egg to make an omelet. And um, just don't burn, burn all of your beds at the same time and don't burn them every year. You don't need to do that. I burn my beds on a rotating three-year schedule. Great. Um, there's a really quick question. Someone's wondering the plant on the screen with the, with the white circular balls. Can you tell us about what that plant is? Oh, that's Rattlesnake Master. Eryngium yuccifolium. It's a cool plant. Everybody who sees it says, I got to have one of those or more. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's good as an accent plant planted with other shorter things around it. Rattlesnake master, go get some. Absolutely. Um, okay, we're gonna wrap it up. Drew, thank you so much. I um, have learned so much more than, than I knew before we started this session. And I just, um, you know, it really came through to me is just the um, compelling reasons to that you presented tonight to really uh, make a commitment to use native plants. I think. Um, Go save the world. Go save the world. Yeah, plant. absolutely. It's something that each one of us can do, and and um, and have such a tremendous impact. You can. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, be well. And if you're registered for Heather's session. We'll see you in April. Thank you so much, Drew. You're welcome. Goodbye. Bye.